This video is sponsored by NordVPN. NordVPN features thousands of servers in over 61 countries, no data logging, 24-7 customer support, and it even works in China. If you're like me and occasionally find yourself either on sketchy websites or public Wi-Fi, you don't want your internet activity monitored, or maybe you'd like to binge geo-blocked content, then a VPN will definitely help you out. Just in time for the holidays, if you head over to nordvpn.com slash rainbot or use promo code rainbot, you'll get 81% off a three-year plan, plus two amazing gifts. Four extra months absolutely free and the new NordPass password manager app. Again, that's nordvpn.com slash rainbot or promo code rainbot. Thank you NordVPN for making this video possible and for supporting independent content on the internet. The year is 2012. The home of 36-year-old Joshua Powell is up in flames. Not only is Joshua himself inside the inferno, but so are his two young boys, Charlie, age 7, and Brayden, age 5. Just minutes before the blast, an alarmed woman makes a panicked call to 911. And I'd like to pull out of the driveway because I smell gasoline and he won't let me in. You want to pull out of the driveway because you smell gasoline, but he won't let I you... I smell... He, he won't let me in. All right. We'll have somebody look for you there. Okay. How long will it be? I don't know, ma'am. They have to respond to emergency, life-threatening situations first. The first available deputy... Well, this, is could, this could be life-threatening. He went to court on Wednesday, and he, he didn't get his kids back. And this is really... I'm, a, I'm afraid for their lives. The woman on the phone is actually the Powell family social worker. In fact, she was the very person who was supposed to be supervising the visit between Joshua and his two sons before the man forcibly locked her out and subsequently set the home ablaze. An investigation immediately following the fire confirmed it to be a murder-suicide, one made even more disturbing by the fact that Joshua, according to autopsies, had taken a hatchet to his sons before ultimately succumbing to smoke inhalation. You're probably wondering how anyone could do that to two innocent children, let alone their own flesh and blood. You may also be wondering why there was a social worker involved and where the boy's mother was during this tragedy. And the thing is, no one actually knows. As things stand today, we're likely to never know the truth about where she was, even if the answer at this point is glaringly obvious. Tonight, we take a look at the frustrating, perplexing, disturbing, and overall tragic story of the Powell family. Once upon a time, there seemed to be a connection between Joshua Powell and future wife Susan Cox. The two had met at a church dinner party in the late months of the year 2000 and soon started a relationship. But unfortunately for Susan, she had no idea what she was getting herself and eventually her two sons into. Joshua was, for lack of a better term, an unstable person. As a teen, Joshua was known to hurt small animals, a notable episode being when he killed his own sister's pet gerbils. Eventually, his aggressions were directed towards people, and at one point, he even drew a knife on his own mother. As you probably guessed, Joshua didn't come from a good home. Not by a long shot. By 1992, Joshua was 16 years old, and his parents were in the middle of a nasty divorce, specifically over Father Stephen Powell's inappropriate behavior and his straying away from the family church. The Associated Press noted that within the couple's divorce documents, Terry Powell, Joshua's mother, had pointed out a number of disturbing facts. According to her, Steve Powell saw nothing wrong with showing his children, including Joshua, sexually explicit material. These claims were later backed up by Joshua's own sister, Jennifer, who told the press of a particularly disturbing episode that took place when she was just 11 years of age. Steve had decided to take young Jennifer with him during a business trip, and according to her, he'd openly watched pornography while she was present, completely disregarding the fact that his own daughter could see exactly what he was up to. Of course, this was all still unknown to Susan Cox, and in 2001, she became Susan Powell the ceremony taking place just under six months after the pair had initially met. Following the wedding, presumably due to a lack of funds, the newlyweds moved into Steve Powell's residence where things quickly began to spiral. Susan was about to find out what kind of man her father-in-law really was. While living under Steve's roof, Susan would endure endless instances of sexual harassment as Steve developed an unusual obsession with her, all this despite the fact that Susan was married to his own son. I just had 
was probably the most erotic experience I've had in my entire life. I just I hate to say it, I mean, of course, because I haven't had that many experiences, but Susan has been feeling ill, she had a cold, and I offered to rub her feet, to rub her toes, to give her some stimulation. That went on, I probably rubbed her feet, her toes, her beautiful feet, she has such pretty feet. Of course, everything about her is pretty beautiful. And I know she felt it. I mean, I know she, I mean, she couldn't have missed it. She's not naive either, I know from what I've read in her journals. Um, that girl is not naive. Years later, for reasons we'll get into shortly, it was discovered that Steve had taken thousands of images of his daughter-in-law without her knowledge. That's Susan. There's Josh. Standing with her, but I really want her. I wish she would look my way. She was so pretty today when she came over to the house. Wish the lighting was better. If that wasn't bad enough, he also had a tendency to spy on her at any given opportunity, whether it be in the bathroom or by reading her private journals while she was away. The man even wrote love songs for Susan and posted them to the internet under a pseudonym. In case you thought the list would stop here, it doesn't. What you're looking at are the many used sanitary products and articles of clothing Steve either dug up from the trash or stole from Susan without her knowledge. By 2003, Steve, for some reason, thought it would be a good idea to come out to Susan after offering to drive her to her parents' house. Oddly enough, the conversation was recorded since, as usual, Steve's camcorder was running, although no video was captured since it was supposedly placed in a bag. There is some debate over whether or not this audio was captured on purpose or by accident, but either way, it's incredibly, incredibly unsettling. It'd be great to go to Colorado and something that I shouldn't be interpreting, um, you know, and it just, for example, when we were sitting on the couch, it just felt like you were very, um, you know, I, I mean, I was extremely aroused, and I think you were somewhat aroused, at least I thought. I don't know where you're going with this. But Susan, I don't, I, I, my, yeah, well, I'll tell you what I'm, where I'm, I'm married to your son, and they should just be the daughter-in-law. As you probably noticed, Susan mentioned possibly moving away from Stephen's Washington home, and in 2004, the couple relocated to Utah where Susan hoped for a new beginning and a happily ever after, but sadly, it would never come. A year later, in 2005, Susan became a mother, and by 2007, she had her second child with Joshua. Despite being blessed with two young boys and finally being away from her creep of a father-in-law, the nightmare didn't end for Susan. A woman by the name of Catherine Everett was one of the first ever to be in a relationship with Joshua, the two dating years prior to Susan's appearance. In 2018, Catherine would open up about her experience with Joshua Powell on the investigative podcast, Cold. There, she spoke of Joshua's tendency to be controlling and possessive. According to her, she wasn't even allowed to visit family without Joshua accompanying her. It became clear that Joshua, despite now being older and a father, did not change his old ways. Susan's friends and family became especially concerned, noting Joshua's, quote, extremely controlling behavior towards Susan. 
On top of this, Joshua was incredibly irresponsible with the family's finances, eventually filing for bankruptcy in 2007 with a staggering $200,000 in claimed debts. Uh, this is me. July 29th, 2008. It is 1233 Mountain Time. Um, covering all my bases, making sure that if something happens to me or my family or all of us that our assets are documented. Hope everything works out and we're all happy and live happily ever after as much as that's possible. Here's the kind of pimping out stuff he's done to his computer. He built it himself. Here is a rigid saw. I don't know the differences. I think this is a chop saw. This is all stuff bought in a year or less through Home Depot on my credit. Josh bought a lot of stuff and then he had to bankrupt it. Oh, there's his RC car. I think he's got probably a 3,000 worth of supplies in the RC car world. So he bought drill sets. There's a nail gun by Boss Stitch. This remote, I guess, is like $300 justified by a babysitter to be able to run our TV. By this point, Susan had been preparing for something, although she wasn't specific as to what. All she knew was that she felt like something was going to happen to her and that she didn't trust her husband. This is actually something she admitted in a secret, handwritten last will and testament in which she also documents the following details. The will was dated June 28th of 2008, and according to Susan, by that point, she'd been experiencing what she describes as extreme marital stress for approximately the last three or four years. She expresses the need for a paper trail in the event that something happens to her, and specifically wants to leave it where her husband wouldn't have easy access. I want it documented somewhere that there is extreme turmoil in this marriage, she writes. He, that being Joshua, has threatened to skip the country and told me straight out, quote, if we divorce, there will be no lawyers, only a mediator, and I will ruin you. I would be ruined too, but you would be destroyed and your life would be over. The boys will not grow up with a mom and a dad. Next to this quote lies a side note dating the exact moment Joshua uttered this, which was just the day before. Susan continues, urging whoever reads it to question everything in the event of her death or disappearance. Talk to my sister-in-law, she says. Check my blogs on MySpace, check my work desk, talk to my friends, coworkers, and family. It's an open fact that we have life insurance policies of over one million if we die within the next four years. Susan also states that she's pleaded with Joshua in order to save their marriage. She has asked him to try counseling, but that was ultimately met with resistance and Joshua constantly redirecting the blame back onto her. On several occasions, he would bring up being upset at Susan for not buying cheaper groceries, specifically of outdated price ranges that were impossible to obtain by 2008. He also told her that his reasoning behind, quote, being mean to her was due to the terrible economy, which he felt was the fault of Republican leadership. Once again, doubling down on the grocery thing, Joshua had explained to Susan that if only she'd stop overspending on groceries, then their marital problems would simply disappear. Again, this coming from the man who felt the need to spend thousands on remote-controlled toys. As I said at the beginning of all this, it was clear that Susan had been bracing herself for something terrible to happen, although she didn't know what or whenever it was going to take place. That day finally came on December 7th of 2009, about a year and a half after she'd written her will. Susan Powell went missing, and technically speaking, the rest of the family did as well. Terry and Jennifer, again Joshua's mother and sister, were alerted that morning that Charlie and Brayden hadn't been dropped off at daycare, and upon not being able to get a hold of Joshua or Susan, they decided to alert authorities. Police had actually decided to break into the Powell home due to the possibility that the family had fallen victim to carbon monoxide poisoning, but none of them could be found anywhere. The only thing out of the ordinary noted was the existence of two box fans placed in front of a wet stain on the carpet. Inside the home, police found Susan's personal belongings, including her wallet and ID, things most people wouldn't just run off without. Susan didn't make it into work that morning, and by late afternoon, Joshua and the two boys had surfaced. When questioned, Joshua would issue statements that would soon become famous for their absurdity. 
Now, according to Joshua, he had no idea where Susan was because the last time he saw her was the night before the family had been reported missing. He claims that Susan had already checked in for sleep, and shortly after midnight, he decided to take Charlie and Brighton out for a spontaneous camping trip. Keep in mind, this was during winter. Upon his return, he was just as shocked as everyone else that his wife was nowhere to be found. The cops didn't believe his story, the media didn't, and anyone else watching the news sure as hell didn't believe him either. Following Susan's disappearance, Joshua decided to embark on a parade of incriminating behavior. He, as expected, emptied Susan's retirement account and even canceled any upcoming appointments of hers that he was aware of. In an article by the Salt Lake Tribune, a friend of Joshua by the name of Tim Peterson described him as pretty unfazed upon their meeting just two days after Susan had gone missing. Peterson, naturally being alarmed by the situation, asked multiple times about Susan, but according to him, Joshua claimed to not be worried about it because, quote, the police were handling it. During one of his first interviews, Joshua is visibly shaken and nervous about something. At one point, he even seems to forget what year he married Susan. All right. When did you guys get married? What year did you get married? Uh, 2000. It's probably in a blank. I think it was 2000, but either that or it was 2001. Okay. And it was in April. <coughs> April? Yeah, yeah, actually April 6th. Okay. I should point out before moving on that this entire interview lasts quite a while, and at the beginning of it, Joshua insists on having a lawyer present, at one point mentioning that he felt that the police were trying to trap him for having what appeared to be defensive wounds on his hands. Now, disregarding that for a second, one might argue that this is just Joshua's way of processing grief, as everyone does so differently, but the evidence pointing this case in his direction doesn't stop there. DNA was recovered from the Powell home from both the floor and couch. Both samples were a confirmed match to Susan, and oddly enough, the State of Utah Crime Lab also notes the presence of DNA from, quote, an unknown male contributor. During the investigation, police naturally questioned everyone they could, including Susan and Joshua's sons, Charlie and Brayden. Charlie, who was four years old at the time, famously told detectives that the camping trip did indeed take place. But contrary to Joshua's account, Charlie claims that his mother did come with them. She just didn't come back. Charlie, weeks later, would speak up once again, but this time to one of his teachers, and according to the child, his mother was dead. Eventually, Brayden too would chime in, even if unintentionally. According to Charles Cox, that's Susan's father and the boy's maternal grandfather, the summer after Susan went missing, Brayden drew a family portrait, specifically of them taking a road trip of sorts. Three figures were visible from within the car, and according to Brayden, quote, Mommy was in the trunk. Another famous aspect of this case came from co-workers of Joshua who alleged that the man had spoken to them about where he would hypothetically hide a body, believing that the best place to do so would be in a mine shaft in the West Utah desert, a place that cops were unlikely to search due to instability. These areas actually were in fact searched by officials, and so were the camping grounds Joshua frequented, but there was still no trace of Susan or her body. On the civilian front, efforts were being made by the local community to find Susan before anything terrible happened. By December 28th of 2009, the local news had jumped on the story. Vigils were held, posters and flyers were spread, and by early January, the community even began taking their efforts to social media. Meanwhile, Joshua had other things in mind, and while he did try to at least seem like he was helping with the search, he also was planning on leaving the town permanently. Keep in mind, this is supposed to be an innocent man who's packing up and moving just a month after his wife went missing instead of hunkering down and waiting for her. On January 6th, Joshua and his brother Michael, an important figure for later, packed up the Powell family home in Utah and made their way back to Washington State, along with Charlie and Brayden. This brings Stephen Powell, again Joshua's creepy father, back into the picture as Joshua, Charlie, and Brayden would now reside at his home. This is also where Michael and a couple other Powells would also be living. Needless to say, that house was way too crowded. Joshua did, on occasion, return to Utah, but only to repair his old home, which he now intended on renting out. While this was all going on, the media didn't let up. 
Joshua began to fall deeper and deeper under scrutiny as the Cox family began to speak out about his and Susan's terrible marriage. They even claim that Susan was considering divorce before she disappeared, something actually echoed in journal entries recovered by police. Susan writes of her distaste for Joshua, calling him two-faced, controlling, and distant. She also created lists to spell out exactly what was on her mind, questions about the divorce process, custody of her two sons, and even what to do in the event of a possible kidnapping. For Susan's family, it was clear just what kind of person their son-in-law was, and what he had done to Susan and, in turn, his own children. But the Powells, specifically Steve and Joshua, had a completely different story, and they wanted the world to hear it. Around February of 2010, SusanPowell.org was created, and initial renditions featured descriptions of Susan, mainly of her legacy and interests, and hopeful messages praying for her safe return. Throughout the remaining months of 2010, however, the post would become increasingly more problematic and paranoid-sounding. Sections slandering the Cox family would appear, claiming them to be the true abusers that damaged Susan's psyche. Meanwhile, efforts were made to paint Joshua as a victim, nothing more than a loving father and husband framed by the media and his in-laws. This narrative, of course, would evolve, and eventually SusanPowell.org started putting forth the theory that Susan simply left Joshua for another man, specifically one by the name of Stephen Kosher. Their evidence was insubstantial, citing the fact that both individuals shared the same age, untrue, religion, and cities. The site also points out that they both disappeared within the same week. Directly under their evidence is a line which reads, Susan Powell's father-in-law, Steve Powell, had learned about Stephen Kosher and noted many parallels connecting these two cases. Steve Powell immediately contacted law enforcement to share this information. As it turns out, the report Steve wrote is available online, and I took the liberty of going through it so you don't have to. Dated February 24th of 2010, the report outlined possible motivations for Susan's abandonment and ways that her and Kosher could have met. Stephen tries very hard to portray Susan as lustful and forever dissatisfied with her life no matter how blessed she is. At one point, he even says this, I also concluded that I was in denial when I refused to accept the possibility that Susan may have been involved in a love affair and have run off with another man, something I should have accepted readily given my <clears throat> above average familiarity with her sexual proclivities. I need a shower. But anyway, SusanPowell.org doesn't list an author, but I think it's pretty safe to assume who was behind it since the site even went as far as to post Susan's private diary entries from as far back as teenhood. This massive, massive invasion of privacy also being an attempt to paint her as a broken woman capable of abandoning her family. The release of these journals was a major contributor to heightened tensions between the Powell and Cox families. The disputes, which carried well into 2011, would also lead to another major twist in this story. So your belief is she's alive, she's with oh, someone? Oh yeah, we believe that. We believe she's alive, we believe she left with somebody. We're not sure if she's still with that somebody, but I don't know, she probably is. On August 25, 2011, investigators carried out Operation Tsunami, the main objective of which was to see Susan's journals and hopefully uncover other evidence that could convict Joshua and possibly even Stephen. They did, in fact, recover the journals, but that's not all they found while searching the home. The father-in-law of a missing Utah woman is facing several years in prison after being convicted on voyeurism charges. A Washington state jury found Steve Powell guilty on Wednesday of all 14 counts against him. He'd been accused of taking photos and videotaping women, including his daughter-in-law, Susan Powell, without them knowing it. Those files also included two of his young neighbors bathing and using the toilet. The allegations flowed from an investigation into Susan's 2009 disappearance. Her parents have long believed that Steve Powell knows something about what happened to their daughter. This raid, along with endless other contributing factors, resulted in Charlie and Brayden being placed in the temporary care of their mother's parents. A custody hearing was to take place, and if Joshua wanted a chance at winning, he would have to move out of his pedo father's home. As a result, he quickly began renting a home in Graham, not far from where he, Steve, and the boys had been living for the last several months. The custody hearings lasted for the remainder of 2011 and eventually stretched into 2012, where a final decision was made. 
On the 1st of February 2012, primary custody of Charlie and Brayden was ultimately awarded to the Cox family as per Susan's wishes, but supervised visitation was still allowed. Just four days later, one such meeting was to occur at Joshua's Graham home, and, well, we unfortunately know what happened on that day. And people are saying there's not somebody here, but I was just there, and there is somebody here. There's two little boys in the house, and there was, you know, five and seven, and there's an adult man. He had supervised visitation, and he blew up the house and the kids. The kids and the husband and the father were in the house? Yeah, yes, he slammed the door in my face. So I kept knocking. I thought it was a mistake. I kept knocking, and then I called 911. The murder-suicide wasn't spontaneous. Joshua had donated his son's toys to charity and even emptied out his bank accounts. And in the final moments leading up to the fire, he contacted family to say his final words. With Joshua and the two boys dead, there seemed to be little hope for finding out the truth behind what happened to Susan. That is, unless someone else had the answers. A few months prior to Joshua's suicide, police had started on the tale of his brother Michael. The going theory at that point was that Michael assisted Joshua in either murdering Susan or by disposing of her body. Maybe even both. Many theorize that the DNA of the unknown male contributor found alongside Susan's blood may have actually belonged to Michael. Whether or not this was ever actually tested is unclear. Through their investigations, they uncovered some particularly interesting information in regards to a transaction Michael made not long after Susan's disappearance. On December 23rd of 2009, Michael reached out to a local auto shop looking to sell his 1997 Ford Taurus, quickly doing so for a mere $100. Police were unaware of this until late 2011, but as soon as they figured it out, cadaver dogs were brought on site. Initially, investigators were worried about the sheer number of old, beaten-up vehicles sold at said lot, many of which could possibly be misleading if any were in collisions or whatever else would leave traces of things like blood and human tissue. But much to everyone's surprise, the dogs had no problem at all and immediately signaled to just one car. Michael Powell's car, to be exact. To top this off, it's also reported that sometime following the auto shop incident and subsequent interviews by police, Michael Powell attempted to buy satellite images of the location from a business called Apollo Mapping, presumably to somehow see if the car was still there. Again, this was just a few months before Joshua's death, but it ultimately didn't lead to any arrests. Why? Well, despite a very thorough swabbing of the car's interior, and especially its trunk, the lab reports concluded that no human DNA could be detected on majority of the samples. As for the remaining few, the report states that no DNA profiles were developed. Now, regardless, suspicion still lingered over Michael's head, especially given the fact that before Joshua's death, he'd made his brother the primary beneficiary of his life insurance policy. To be more precise, over 90% of it was to be left in Michael's name. Ultimately, however, this trail would also lead to nothing as Michael Powell, like his brother, decided to take his own life in early 2013. His motives were unclear, although many assume that if he was guilty, his end could have been brought about by guilt or a fear that police were finally closing in. Steve Powell was also long suspected of somehow being involved, especially following his child pornography charges and his obsession with Susan being made public. This, however, much like everything else in this case, was never proven. Steve did serve jail time following the raid at his home, and he eventually was released, specifically in 2017. This might be a bit unprofessional right now, but the dude died like a year later and I'm sure no one misses him. As for Susan, the 10-year anniversary of her disappearance recently passed. Her case remains technically unsolved, even if everyone pretty much agrees on what happened to her. The going theory, and again, I'll stress that this is mere speculation, is that Joshua murdered Susan, the means of which were unclear, although many suspect some kind of poisoning or drugging. He then took her body off on the so-called camping trip along with the boys in the middle of the night, then passed her on to Michael, who ultimately disposed of her somewhere in the vast Utah desert. 
Alternatively, it is possible that Michael was present at the home and the unknown DNA left behind was from him incurring defensive wounds as Joshua was accused of having. Again, for legal reasons, I'm going to reiterate that these are just prominent theories from years of the masses following this case, and they obviously do pose some of their own issues. Unfortunately, we're never going to know exactly how things went down. Susan's case is now closed, and as for her remaining relatives, they maintain and run the Susan Cox Powell Foundation, the mission of which is to assist families of missing persons while also helping victims of domestic violence. An emphasis is especially placed on early signs and what to keep an eye out for. Thank you so much for watching, and I'd like to give a huge, huge thank you to the following Patreon supporters. T. Gorman, Andrew, Jeremy, Raphael, Rain, Esper, Nix, Lance, Eric, Yerme, Zarai, Joel, Julian, Avocadro, Shelby, Q, VHS, Squid, Garth, Jay, Shadow, Danielle, Ursula, and Krista. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all again soon.